Hey everybody, Bill de Blasio is running for president. If you are not excited about that, you are not alone because virtually nobody seems to be excited about it, including Bill de Blasio's own political staff who begged him not to run for president. The New York Times did a brutal story recently where they surveyed elected officials in New York City and ordinary residents and asked them what they thought about de Blasio running for president, and every single one of them... (laughs) pretty much was on their knees begging Bill de Blasio not to run for president, yet he's doing it anyway. This is actually maybe the only candidate that I'm a little bit surprised is actually running because there are so many potential liabilities for him that it almost doesn't make sense on a strategic level. But when you think about it a little more deeply, it actually does have a logic, and I'll get into why. The thing to bear in mind is For these candidates, most of whom know that they have a very small shot of actually winning the Democratic presidential nomination, running heightens their profile. It's a lucrative business enterprise. So once you seek the presidency, that becomes part of your title. So you get book deals, you get speaking fees, you get consultancies. It almost makes sense just on a financial level for these candidates to do it just to improve their own professional standing. And that gets to the fundamental corruption of how the system currently operates. Think back to 2016. You had a large Republican field. The Democratic field is larger now. But who are some people who ran in 2016? George Pataki, the governor of New York, ended up running. And for what purpose? Nobody ever thought he had a remote chance of winning. But as little of an effect as his, can- as his candidacy had, it was better for his purposes to run than to not run. Uh, pe- more people became familiar with George Pataki by dint of him running. It's as simple as that. Go back even further. Al Sharpton, people forget, ran for president in 2004 as a Democrat. It later came out that who else but Roger Stone helped facilitate that campaign because he thought it would discredit the Democrats, which it kind of did. But what happened to Al Sharpton after he ran in 2004? Became a much more influential figure in the party. He now has all kinds of prominent media roles, including on MSNBC. The candidates now are constantly going to kiss his ring and try to get his tacit endorsement. So it made perfect sense for Al Sharpton to run. And now we're even in a more hyper turbocharged era where there's much more opportunities for media visibility. So if you're Bill de Blasio, why the hell not run? Mayor Pete surged to, you know, near the top of the polls. And this guy is the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, which has a population of around 100,000 people. New York City, as you might know, is a little bit bigger. It's around 83 times bigger, actually, in terms of population. So I could see Bill de Blasio looking out at Mayor Pete being touted across the media as this, you know, rising star and saying, you know, what the heck? Uh, I'm actually the mayor of the biggest city in the country, in the country and arguably the most influential and powerful city in the world. So I might as well run. I mean, the governor of Montana just announced his campaign this past week, Steve Bullock. And I don't know how many orders of magnitude bigger in population size New York City is than Montana, but it's quite a few. And, you know, it made sense for Steve Bullock to run as well. I mean, look at his rationale. He got reelected in 2016 when Trump won Montana by a large margin. That's somewhat of a notable electoral accomplishment. There aren't that many Democrats running from red states in the race so far. So for Bullock's purposes, it made perfect sense as well. The point is the incentive structure around why these candidates choose to run for president is so warped. And it also goes into the idiocy of how prolonged and protracted these campaign cycles are. They start two years before the election, arguably even longer if you incorporate, you know, the the behind-the-scenes machinations that these candidates do. So the opportunity for grift is ripe, and you can't blame them in a way for taking advantage of it. But with Bill de Blasio in particular, 
people forget, or maybe they never even knew, that he was under a major ethical cloud for a long time and still kind of is. But it was most acute when he was under federal criminal investigation for over a year having to do with potential allegations of corruption around his fundraising practices. And it was so severe that the uh, U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York came out in March of 2017 and actually put out a statement outlining Bill de Blasio's conduct and no charges were brought, but it's an unusual step for a prosecutor to come out and actually describe the conduct of a political official or anybody, even while he does not bring charges against that individual. Now, this practice seems to have gotten somewhat more common recently, at least in the high profile cases. James Comey infamously did it with Hillary Clinton in in July of 2016 when he declined to bring charges against her relating to the email server case, but nonetheless went on a long speech about her conduct, which he denounced. Uh, Robert Mueller just put out a 448-page report detailing Donald Trump's conduct despite not bringing charges against Trump or recommending charges. So this seems to be getting a little more common. Maybe it's confined just to the especially notable cases involving political figures, but it's kind of a civil liberties concern because if if prosecutors don't charge you on something, but they nonetheless come out in public and basically malign your integrity, you have no opportunity to rebut them as you would in the setting of a courtroom when you're trying to establish your innocence or at least your lack of guilt. So who knows, but for the U.S. attorney to come out and have done that in March of 2017 with, with, with respect to Bill de Blasio was especially significant. And people probably never heard it, but lots of people in, in, in New York City or even out of New York City probably never even heard about all that because that was such a frenzied period with the national news. There were constant leaks about Trump and Russia and Jeff Sessions and Mike Flynn and all this kind of stuff. So it probably got largely drowned out. Um, but actually on that same date, the prosecutors in New York coordinated with state prosecutors and they both put out statements outlining Bill de Blasio's conduct because Bill de Blasio was at the same time under state criminal investigation. So he had a lot going on at that time criminally. Um, and the letter put out, this was on March 16th, 2017, the letter put out by the attorney, the, uh, U S attorney at the time, June Kim, who had just taken over for pre Barara, who was fired by Trump. That letter is relatively short, but if you can go and look at the long letter put out by, uh, Vance, who was the district attorney for Manhattan, um, outlining his rationale for not bringing charges against de Blasio. And it's a lot more expansive. I mean, this, that's a nightmare. If you're a private citizen and the prosecutors who have been investigating you for months or years decides not to bring charges, which is, you know, at least that's something that you achieve. You're not being charged, but nonetheless, the prosecutor decides to put out a, 10 page letter basically denouncing you. I mean, that's crazy. Um, And that's a huge ethical cloud over your head. And for Bill de Blasio to nonetheless now be running for president, which is obviously going to bring a whole new level of scrutiny to all this. It's just a major, it's almost unprecedented, maybe not unprecedented, but like historic levels of hubris on his part. The prosecutor in uh, Manhattan's, uh, again, Cy Vance Jr., Cyrus Vance Jr., put out a 10-page statement accusing de Blasio of violating, of quote, violating the spirit of the law by circumventing campaign finance regulations because the state prosecutors were investigating de Blasio's effort in 2014 to raise funds for the Democrats in that year's state election so that they could take the state Senate 
And in order to do this, he, you know, blew past all kinds of uh, campaign finance statutes to the point where he was under this very intensive legal scrutiny. And the only reason why federal prosecutors didn't bring charges against him is because of a 2016 Supreme Court decision which vacated the conviction of Bob McDonnell, who is the governor of Virginia, and was convicted of basically taking bribes um, from a major donor and then enacting official government action on that donor's behalf. Um, That went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court threw it out unanimously. So you can't attribute that solely to the right wing of the court or the left. It was a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court, but that narrowed the scope of what was deemed legally to be corrupt action on the part of a government official. And that really seems to be the only reason why Bill de Blasio got off. So he, he, he really uh, caught a break there, and which makes it all the more insane that he's now running. I mean, so much stuff is now going to come out that either hadn't come out at all or, or had been buried by the news cycle about de Blasio's various activities that raise serious ethical questions you know he used a private email for city business you know shout out to hillary clinton on that although bill de blasio doesn't didn't seem to set up a private server but still um you know one of the donors that he was doing favors for ended up getting convicted of separate corruption charges this was a donor who had a multi-million dollar lease dispute with new york city and de blasio was trying to help the person out um a lot of donors were granted immunity as a part of that federal corruption investigation. They might come out and talk more about what ha- went on. So it's just wild that he's doing it. I'm I'm legitimately surprised that he ended up doing it. I thought it was just a trial balloon, um, a little exposure or whatever. Um, but no, he's, he's in it. Um, one thing that's going to be hilarious is the New York City media is just going to brutalize this guy. Every day, both tabloids, the New York Times, you know, the TV media, the online media, they're just going to go wild <laughs> denouncing Bill de Blasio at every possible opportunity because no- nothing is an easier cheap shot to take than the mayor being out of the city constantly to you know run around Iowa in the cornfields trying to get the votes of you know, residents of Sioux City or, uh, you know, Des Moines or whatever. So elected officials are going to go after him in New York City. It's just going to be a shit show. Um, Andrew Cuomo is going to have a field day. I mean, they already have a longstanding feud. So he's going to have pot shots and jabs all the time. It's going to be entertaining. Um, but they're, they're, it really is ironic because the media discussion for months had been speculating that the major New York New York figures who would run for president were gonna were gonna be Mike Bloomberg, who decided not to run. You know, probably smartly, because that would have been a disaster, or Andrew Cuomo, who may have ran if Biden hadn't been running. Um, but now he supports Biden. He's going to be attending a big fundraiser with a hedge fund manager for Biden next month in New York City. Um, but the guy who ends up running is Bill de Blasio, who nobody even really considered because it was seemed too comical that he would actually run. But he's running. You know, one thing that is going to be yet another controversy is the extent to which the NYPD is used to shuffle de Blasio around on his campaign stops because the taxpayers of New York City are essentially going to be subsidizing and security. And I remember covering Chris Christie in 2016, and he would have this elite unit of the New Jersey State Police chauffeuring him around New Hampshire at taxpayer expense. And, you know, obviously, if you're the governor or the mayor, that's within your authority to, to, to use it that way. But it's going to become a little bit of a political controversy, I would think, although Christie largely got away with it, despite my best efforts. Um and one hilarious thing I saw was on the New York Times, you know, article just uh, on the announcement today. One of the top comments was 
bring back Mike Bloomberg exclamation point. Um, so if people are, are actually pining for Mike Bloomberg to come back, you know you're in a rough spot. But what what's the ultimate point of all this? De Blasio likely knows that he has very minuscule chance of actually winning the nomination. His approval ratings in New York City, which is overwhelmingly Democrat, are in the in the tank. Um, so why is he doing it? Well, I mean, maybe he does have just this ego trip where he does think he has a legitimate chance of running. He has in New York City had some notable accomplishments, you know, universal pre-K, uh, you know, crime is very low in New York City still. Um, on the other hand, you have people constantly complaining about the subway. There's home- homelessness has spiked. So it's a mixed bag, but at least, you know, he has some stuff that he can feasibly tout as legitimate accomplishments. But it goes back to the fundraising. De Blasio already pioneered this tactic of employing all these very uh, assertive fundraising tactics for his mayorality, which got him in legal jeopardy. But now he can do the same, but on a much grander scale. So if you have business before the city, even if you don't even like Bill de Blasio, a great way to get your contract, your contracting process expedited is to give, write a big check to Bill de Blasio's presidential campaign and even maybe his nonprofit, which he has and which is used for dubious purposes. A lot of candidates have that. I covered well before he was even in the Senate. Cory Booker had this nonprofit in Newark called uh, Newark Now. I think that's what the name was. But 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 basically, it's just so they could do an end run around campaign finance laws and just have this kind of uh, nest egg for themselves that they can use for political purposes, but it's not like, it's not uh, reportable. It's not, it doesn't need to be reported in the same way. It's just a typical. So Bill's got one of those. And even if he has no shot in the world, he now has a very compelling pitch to make to donors who, uh, to give him money. Because if you want to curry influence with the mayor, you're going to give him money. It's as simple as that. It's a business decision. So that's basically the explanation. There's another hilarious thing, because in 2017, when he was under investigation, de Blasio wasn't getting a lot of contributions for his reelection campaign in 2017 from people who lived in New York City. So what did he do? He flew around the country to, you know, Florida, California, etc., to get raise money. And he went to California and two of his biggest donors on that California trip ended up just getting utterly obliterated by Me Too a couple months later. So one of them was Russell Simmons, the founder of Def Jam. And one of them, another was David Glasser, who was the president of the Weinstein Company. So that's who Bill de Blasio had to rely on in his you know, Los Angeles tour, uh, raising money in 2017 when nobody wanted to give him money uh, in, in New York. Anyway... Uh, it's going to be funny to watch. I'm actually kind of happy in a way that he's running because there's just going to be so much lulls. Um, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> I have some guesses, but, uh, anyway, I'll talk to you later.